Welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you join us today for the Sharsharit Summit bonus program, the final event in our week of educational programming. Sharsharit in the Kitchen, Simply Sensational Sides with Adina Sussman and Sharon Weeder. I'm Jessica Jablon. I'm the California Program Coordinator at Sharsharit. For those of you who don't know about Sharsharit, we help women and families facing breast and ovarian cancer, as well as those who are at elevated genetic risk through free, confidential, and personalized support and resources. We also provide health education throughout the country. One of our goals during COVID is to make sure that we are offering healthy living and cancer prevention information to you during this hard time and giving you what support you need. In addition to our virtual services that can be found on our website or by emailing us, you can also access prior webinars on a range of cancer-related topics, as well as access our calendar of upcoming and virtual programs through our website. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Sharsharit's website along with the transcript. Participants' spaces and names will not be in the recording as long as you remain muted. If you would like to remain private, you can turn off your video and rename yourself, or you can call into the webinar. Instructions are in the chat box now for both options. You may have noticed that all participants were muted upon entry. Please keep yourself on mute throughout the call. If you have questions for Idina or Sharon, put them in the chat box, either publicly or click on share, share it in the chat box to submit a private question and I will ask them throughout the program. Now, as we move into the webinar itself, I also wanna remind you that Sharsharit is a national not-for-profit cancer support and education organization and does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Sharsharit is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for medical specific medical conditions. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat a health problem. If you have any questions that are specific to your medical care, our presenters may not be able to advise regarding specifics and we would advise that you speak to your medical provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or qualified health provider with questions you may have regarding a medical condition. We are thrilled to a new season of Short Sharing in the Kitchen, an initiative in partnership with Cedar sinai here in Los Angeles to empower those of us at risk for breast and ovarian cancer to make healthier diet choices. Prior Sharsharing in the Kitchen webinars and information about our nutrition pilot for Los Angeles County residents can be accessed on our website at the link in the chat. You should have received the recipes for today's program in advance, but my colleague is going to put the link in the chat box so you can download and print it or see it on your screen. We want to thank our generous sponsors, Cedar sinai the Cooperative Agreement DP19-1906 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and our incredible summit sponsors who were displayed on the introduction slide. It is thanks to their support that we are able to continue to provide our series of webinars throughout the pandemic. Now, before we get cooking, I want to introduce you to Carly, who is going to share her personal story with us. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everyone, I'm Carly. Um, March 20th, 2017, that was the day I found out my mom had breast cancer. The day, the place, the conversation, it will forever be ingrained in my mind. My family had never imagined that we would be coordinating chemo and radiation schedules, creating master calendars for who would take my mom to doctor's appointments, and yet here we were. One of the first things my mom did when she found out she was BRCA negative, I'm sorry, when she found out she had breast cancer was to test for the BRCA gene. When she found out she was BRCA negative, we all exhaled a huge sigh of relief. While it didn't ease the pain of her situation, it did bring some comfort knowing that there was not a genetic component. After a double mastectomy, two rounds of chemo, one round of radiation and a reconstructive surgery, my mother was declared in remission. In November, 2020, my uncle, my father's brother suddenly passed away. While we knew his daughter, my cousin, had had triple negative breast cancer the year prior, we weren't regularly in touch with them. But when he passed, we started to reach out more and speak more frequently. In one conversation, my cousin Damon mentioned his sister had had breast cancer, which we knew, but he also mentioned that she was BRCA1 positive. This we had not known. My father's side of the family had no history of cancer. 
absolutely none. So we figured it must be from her mother's side. Also, my family wasn't very concerned because my mother had tested negative for the mutation. So we assumed if my mother was negative, then there was nothing to worry about for us. That week, in what would become a potentially life-saving coincidence, my sister had a doctor's appointment. She decided to get tested just to be safe. We were all so sure there was nothing to worry about that I said I was only going to test if my sister came back positive. Three or four weeks later, when the test had mostly been forgotten about, the results came back and my sister was in fact BRCA1 positive. My family was shocked. This led to the testing of my family my father, my brother, and myself. All of us were positive. I often think of all the ways that this could have turned out. In our society, there's a huge miseducation behind the genetic components to breast cancer. I figured my mother was negative for the gene, so I must be fine. There's no history of cancer on my dad's side, so it must not be from his side of the family. In fact, my father's sister had tested negative for the BRCA mutation. Who even knew that you could get it from your father? If my sister had been negative, I probably wouldn't have even bothered testing. There were so many opportunities to simply brush it off, but thank God I didn't. That is why I'm so drawn to the work of Sharshara. While they do an incredible job of supporting women with breast and ovarian cancer, they also play a vital and much needed role in educating the community about the genetic risks associated. I found out I was BRCA1 positive in the beginning of February this year. For me, the next steps were easy. I am a mother of a nine, six, and four-year-old. I was not going to put my family in the same position to watch me go through all that we had watched my mother go through only four years earlier. I had my complete hysterectomy at the end of February and my double mastectomy at the end of April. While my journey hasn't always been an easy one, both mentally and physically, I was fortunate to have an organization like Shoshara at my disposal. The incredible staff members and their resources played an important role in further educating me about the gene and what that meant for my children and the rest of my family, helping me process, process my diagnosis, and now giving me an incredible platform to share my story and to hopefully help others. I am so grateful every day that I was informed enough to make this decision and to take my life into my own hands. Thank you to all of you for letting me share my story today. Wow, thank you, Carly, for sharing your story and the story of your family with us and raising awareness in such an important and personal way. Um, you mentioned genetic testing and, and counseling throughout your speech. Um, if anyone has questions, we do have a free genetic counselor on staff here at Sure Share It. Uh, the email is in the chat if you are interested in contacting her to find out if you should think about pursuing genetic testing, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Carly. Uh, also, I wanted to mention October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. So please schedule your appointments, learn your family history, know your body, and talk to your doctor about the right screening plan for you and make sure to contact your healthcare providers if anything doesn't feel right. My colleague is going to put a link to our Know the Facts brochure in the chat. Take a look as it contains some important information as well as signs and symptoms of ovarian and breast cancer for you to be aware of. So our guests today, Adina Sussman and Sharon Weeder have been longtime supporters of Sharsharet, having launched the Pies for Prevention National Thanksgiving Bake Sale in 2008 in memory of their mother and grandmother whom they lost to ovarian cancer. In the past 13 years, Pies for Prevention has raised over $615,000 to support Charcheret's ovarian cancer initiative. The week of Thanksgiving, we typically have about 35 bake sales happening all over the country with individuals or sometimes bakeries selling anything from pies to chocolate chip cookies to pumpkin loaves and more. If you are interested in finding out more about being a baker for Pies for Prevention, please contact Sarah Eagle. Uh, her information will be in the chat. And if you're interested in purchasing baked goods and supporting Sharsharet's 13th annual Pies for Prevention Thanksgiving Bake Sale, visit the link in the chat to see if there's a bake sale happening in your area. And check back as we are always adding bake sales to the list for this year. Now, I am so excited to introduce today's guests. 
Israeli food expert Adina Sussman is the author of Sababa, Fresh Sunny Flavors from My Israeli Kitchen, which was named a best fall cookbook by the New York Times, Bon Appetit and Food and Wine. She is finishing up her follow-up cookbook, Shabbat, all about weekend cooking on Israel, in, on Israel, both modern and traditional, to be released spring 2023. The co-author of 15 cookbooks, three of Adina's most recent collaborations, including Cravings and Cravings Hungry for More with Chrissy Teigen, were New York Times bestsellers. A lifelong visitor to Israel who has been writing about that country's food culture for almost 20 years, Adina made Aliyah in December 2018. She cooks and writes in Tel Aviv, where she lives in the shadow of that city's Carmel Market with her husband, Jay Shofet. You can follow her on Instagram at Adina Sussman. And Sharon Weeder is a registered dietitian nutritionist and the owner of Start Smart Nutrition, Sharon Weeder Nutrition, LLC, a private pediatric nutrition practice focusing on health and wellness for kids, teens, and their families. Sharon holds a certificate in childhood and adolescent obesity and is a mindful and intuitive eating practitioner. She uses a holistic approach to help guide her clients towards achieving a healthier lifestyle through small, impactful changes and realistic goals. Sharon is a breast cancer survivor and is so appreciative to Sharsheret for their programs and support network. She has been a Sharsheret volunteer since her diagnosis and served as a peer supporter or link many times. And just a quick note, make sure you fill out this very short survey evaluation form at the end of the program. Anyone who completes the survey will be entered in a giveaway for one of three copies of Sababa or a one hour virtual nutrition coaching session with Sharon. Adina and Sharon, welcome to Share Shared in the Kitchen and thank you so much for being here today. Thank Hello. you so much. Hi everybody. Hi Adina. Hi my love, my best friend, my sister, 6,000 miles away, but it's so fun to cook with you on screen. Hi everybody, greetings from Tel Aviv. It's nine o'clock um, and Sharon and I are so happy to be here. Um, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that there is no cause that we are mutually more connected to than Shasheret. Um, we, as Sharon, as a breast cancer survivor, which she will tell you about, um, we just embrace this organization and are thrilled to continue to be involved and we'll tell you about our involvement over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, but I'm gonna hand it over to my wonderful sister to get the cooking going and tell everyone what you're making and we'll just have a nice schmooze like we always do when we're cooking together. <laughs> Thank you, love. Uh, greetings from Teaneck, New Jersey, where it's two o'clock in the afternoon and it's actually the first cool day. So the stuffing recipe that I'm about to demo, I think is, um, is very apropos and fitting. Um, Thank you, Carly, for sharing your incredibly inspiring story. It's always amazing um, to hear these stories and, and it gives us great hope. Um, thank you, thank you. So we're gonna begin. I am going to turn on um, the heat under my pan. I hope you can all see. If you can, I'm going to tilt it as I'm cooking. I'm making um, a mushroom and apple stuffing, which actually our mother um, made years ago and it started over Passover and uh, we actually had it in Thanksgiving and I have tweaked it over the years and it's become a family favorite. So something near and dear to our hearts and it evokes memories of our mom who really inspired us to be in the kitchen, to love cooking and um, you know, to hosting people around the table. So while I'm starting and my pan is heating, I'm going to add a few teaspoons of extra virgin olive oil to my pan. And I am going to wait until that gets warm. I have done a little prep work before. I have chopped, I hope you can see this in the, in the light, purple, one purple onion medium size and one regular onion, uh, white onion also medium size. And I have also sliced up two, can you see that two, oops, um, two stalks of celery. And I'm going to put them into my pan. And I'm so, going to be uh, mommy didn't use red onion. Is that something you added because you like the color or because you had it handy one time or why did you switch to red onion? Excellent, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Number one, I love the color and I actually think it adds just a brightness to this dish. 
Number two, yes, I have been without uh, white onions and I love purple onions because especially when they're caramelized, they become sweeter and they add a different, an extra depth to a dish. Um, and also, you know, using a variety of fruits and vegetables, a lots of different colors um, brings in more nutrition, um, more antioxidants, et cetera. So we're adding a little bit of a, of, you know, of a healthier component as well. So yeah, so if you look just right here, I don't know if you can see with the light, but you have the beautiful green, bright green, you have the purple of the onion and then the white onion. So this gets sauteed about uh, four to five minutes where um, the onions just begin to soften a bit and just start to uh, brown. You don't want them to be fried. We want them to still be soft because we're gonna be doing quite a bit of cooking with them and then they're gonna go into the oven. So we don't want them to sort of fall apart. Um, I guess I have a minute or two to talk a little bit about my experience with breast cancer. 16 years ago, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I'm actually my first um, mammogram. I had actually been given the script to the mammogram a year earlier, but when I was given that prescription for, the, for my um, baseline mammogram, our mother, Stephanie Sussman, may she rest in peace, was actually experiencing and going through ovarian cancer. So I got the, the prescription into my purse and forgot about it. Um, a year later, I found it. Our mom was towards the end of her, of, unfortunately, of her, of her fight against ovarian cancer. But I did go for my baseline mammogram and um, they found a lump. And um, I, I'm gonna make a very long story short, I ended up having a double mastectomy with reconstruction. And because of the ovarian cancer history in our family, even though we tested BRCA negative, I also had a complete hysterectomy and bilateral oophorectomy. So that's my, my uh, cancer story and became involved with Charcheric from the beginning um, and have been grateful ever, ever since. So I'm just sauteing this up. It's actually getting nice and yummy. It smells delicious. Um, and you, it's starting to see some caramelization. Can you see that, Jessica? I don't know if it's the, the lights are. It, it looks okay. a little. Yeah, it's okay if you just hold it up to the camera yeah. close. I think people can see it, but people know it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so so um, I'm 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 good in in this department. I think I'm gonna maybe toss it over, hand it over to Adina because I'm gonna let this cook a little bit more, and then amazing. I'll do the next step. All right, so um, we're gonna make a couple of really easy side dishes uh, for Thanksgiving or any time from my cookbook, Sababa. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to cook some frika. Now, frika is um, a cracked smoked wheat. It's kind of like green kern for you major Ashkenazis out there. It's young wheat, but the difference between green kern and frika is that frika is smoked over open fire. It's traditionally something that started in the Arab world and has be, been embraced by um, Israeli cooking as well. Um, I've soaked a cup and a half of frika in water to both soften it and clean it a little bit for about 15 minutes. And I'm gonna drop it into some boiling water. Um, and I'm gonna cook it sort of like I would cook quinoa. Like I put enough water in there so that it, it's gonna cook and absorb all the water and also evaporate um, extra water so that it hopefully just comes out nice and fluffy and perfect. If you don't have frika, because it can be a little bit hard to find, um, you can use barley, you can use wheat berries, you can use brown rice, you can kind of use whatever you want. Um, and the sort of star of this salad is um, the roasted grapes, which a lot of people found very compelling when the book came out. Um, so I'm going to take, um, the, the recipe calls for a cup and a half, but I'm like the queen of excess. So I'm going to do like a little bit over two cups of grapes here. And what I love to do with these grapes is treat them like almost like a roasted vegetable. I, I roast them as I would a savory vegetable. I'm going to drizzle some really good Israeli olive oil. Israel, as you know, many of you has incredible olive oil and I get it by the five gallon uh, jug um, and transfer it to my handy little um, olive oil dispenser. I use this because it's closed and it has very little opportunity for light or oxygen to get the oil and get to the oil and have the oil decompose faster. Oil 
needs to be kept in a dark, cool place. So this is my solution. You can find a lot of these things on Amazon. I'm gonna take some fresh cracked black pepper. My oven has been preheated to um, 400 degrees. And then I'm gonna take kosher salt. I use diamond, which is the um, salt of choice among a lot of people who cook for a living, but you know, any salt will do. You can use fine sea salt, you can use Morton salt, you can use Atlantic salt. You can use anything you want, but I'm just going to um, toss that all together. You can see on the small screen here, look, they already, they look like marbles. They're so beautiful. They're shiny. They've got olive oil over them. And I'm going to pop those right in the oven. And then Adina? the other thing that, yeah. Adina, can we, yeah. Can, can someone substitute quinoa if there's a gluten-free? Absolutely. I actually did this recipe with quinoa for uh, Pesach and um, it was a big hit. Um, as this uh, freak is cooking, I'm going to just take a little bit of the scum from the top and um, pour it off. And I'm going to do some double duty here. The other thing we're making is um, a uh, coleslaw that has roasted nuts on it. And the frika um, also has nuts. So I'm going to take a half a cup of chopped almonds and a half a cup of pumpkin seeds. I'm going to put them on one baking sheet. And I'm gonna just pop those in the oven. And then so I'm, I'm roasting, I'm trying to do a lot of prep in advance. I always like to have tons of roasted nuts around and lots of yummy, Jay, my husband Jay calls them toys to put inside salads. Um, <laughs> and nuts are salad toys in our house. So I'm gonna just, no oil, no salt, no nothing. There's a lot of seasoning in both of these salads. So I'm going to throw this in the oven and I'm going to turn um, back to Sharon. I just thought I would say that um, the Pies for Prevention Bake Sale was our way of helping Sharsheret uh, sort of have a foray into the world of ovarian cancer because we knew that Sharsheret did incredible uh, breast cancer programming. And we thought that the model was there and all we needed to do was take the disease that was relevant to our family and start helping people. So Sharon and I on a lark one Thanksgiving decided to start baking pies together and lo and behold, we raised $16,000 the first year and a friend volunteered to do another sale the next year. So we decided to create this incredible program called Pies for Prevention. And within a few years, there were dozens of sales in different cities around the country. It's a true grassroots organization with very, um, grassroots effort with very little overhead. Everyone pays for their own ingredients or raises the money. People devote their own time and um, all the profits after people's expenses uh, Sometimes people take a little money for their expenses, but almost all the money goes to share, share it. Um, and we just can't believe that we've raised more than half a million dollars to support women living with ovarian cancer and their families. It's a huge honor for us and an amazing way to honor our mother, Steffi, who would have really liked that what we were doing to commemorate her was something happy and fun and involving food. So um, that's a little bit about the program. We can talk about it more, but I'm gonna hand the cooking back to my sister. Before, yeah, we we wanted to share I, 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 before we jump back, I just wanted to ask a question about the Frika. Um, huh? About most, there are a few people who have said that they've seen it at Whole Foods. Is there any huh? other type of that you recommend or? Um, you can, uh, it's available on Amazon with a kosher certification um, in larger quantities for less, for a better price. Oftentimes Middle Eastern stores and Indian markets have it as well. Um, so those are two good places to look for it. I can show you guys, um, what it looks like just on its own. It, it's really has a green color. And when you sort of open the package, it smells incredibly smoky. So that in itself is like another flavor element. It's like, it's, it's like pre-seasoned with this beautiful smokiness. I love smoky food. I use smoked paprika all the time and smoked salt, um, and all those kind of things. And, you know, um, it's, to me, it's a wonderful way to introduce something that's very exotic, but also very healthy. Frika is full of fiber. Um, it's very filling. Uh, my sister can probably speak to that more because she's the nutritionist. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find it um, online or at Middle Eastern markets um, and some kosher markets now as well. Yeah, I, I think Frika is wonderful. It's like, along with all of the other uh, sort of grains that you mentioned, like wheat berry, Faro, um, quinoa, those are all, they, they're high in fiber. They're also some, some of them are higher in protein as well. So they help you to also stay full for longer and you get um, more nutrition 
from them versus like, let's say a, a white rice or, or something that's been overly processed. So it's a wonderful choice, but again, these are interchangeable and you can yeah. use them, you know, um, so, so we're going to move on now to adding these mushrooms, which I actually pre-slice, but if you want to save yourself some time, because this does call for two pounds of mushrooms, which is quite a bit of mushrooms, you can buy them pre-sliced, um, and, and it's just a bit of a time saver. So I'm going to raise the, the heat a bit on my pot, because we are, you see how full this pot is right now, but we know with mushrooms, what happens is um, they shrink and they lose their moisture. And that's one of the things that we want to happen right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna modify the recipe um, that I sent you. And I'm actually gonna add the salt now because the salt helps to break down some of the vegetables and also brings out the, the moisture. Um, Karen, and do recipe, mushrooms have nutritional value? So yeah, mushrooms actually, I, mushrooms do have nutritional value. They're actually, um, they have some antioxidants. They have a bit of fiber in them. They are also um, a wonderful substitute if you have somebody who's a vegetarian, a vegan, who doesn't want to eat have meat or an animal protein. So this this dish and or a dish with that's hearty in mushrooms can be a nice substitute for that and, and can be very quite filling as well. Um, in fact, our mom used to always have many, many side dishes. We grew up in Northern California. There were a lot of vegetarians, a lot of vegans. This was sort of before it became even more popular. And the only sort of animal protein that was on the table would be sort of like the turkey or the chicken. Everything else was par of, you know, did not have any, um, any animal um, protein in it. So that anyone who was around the table really always had a lot to eat and was 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 full and satisfied. And mushrooms was a, played a big role in that. Um, so I'm going to saute these mushrooms. Um, in this recipe, actually, the liquid that comes out of the mushrooms, you're going to see we're going to it's going to actually we're going to use it to help soften the matzo that we're going to add in, into this pot. So. Um, if you happen to have mushrooms that you haven't had a chance or didn't, couldn't buy pre-sliced or pre-cleaned and they're very dirty and you feel like you actually have to wash them, in this recipe having mushrooms which soak up a lot of the water will be okay because you'll actually, when you add the masa, it will soak up that um, liquid and you might not have to add any more to make the, that masa soft. So that's one thing about this recipe, which it sort of lends itself. There yeah. was a question that came in. If uh, is sure. there a way to achieve the same result without salt or with a lot less salt? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Oh, is there a way to achieve the same result without salt or with a lot less salt? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can. You what I would recommend is maybe to cook it on a little bit of a lower temperature, not low, but a little bit lower, so that it softens the vegetables without sort of scorching them or burning them. And it will bring out the liquid eventually. So yes, if you if you need to be mindful of your sodium intake, ab absolutely, that's that's completely fine. Um, also remember that this is for twelve servings, so you know you, you are dividing it. Although I probably could eat it in one serving. <laughs> so, um, what if but, you wanted uh, to? I mean, you could in theory you could make this with bread, right? It's like matzah is our uh, tradition, but you could make yes. it with scale challah or yes. anything, right? So absolutely. So I was actually going to talk a little bit about that when I added the matzah because ah, sorry. Um, there, no, that's fine. Thank you. There was a pre-question pre -question that came in before today about whether you could use gluten-free, uh, you know, how, how to make this a gluten-free recipe. And so I actually demoed one for myself um, and one that I'm going to show you at the end of the program, which was with uh, gluten-free matzah here. So this is gluten-free matzah. Um, the thing with this matzah is that it actually has eggs. So if you have a vegan, it's something, you know, you might want, you might not want to use this because it does, it has eggs in it. However, I did find, a, um, cats is, it's a, it's a, a gluten-free, gluten-free, nut-free, egg-free product that was English muffins, which I thought, you know, like a bread stuffing, you could use that, um, instead of, instead of the matzah. And then you would really have a gluten-free vegan um, substitute for that. So while my mushrooms what? are cooking down, Adina, I guess I can pass it back to you if you want to continue. Or... Uh, sure. Uh, I'm going to just bring the quinoa 
uh, the uh, Frika close to the, the camera so you can see it's bubbling. The water is starting to evaporate. Um, the water has kind of a dirty, cloudy appearance, but that's fine. It just because the the product is smoked, it when it's cooked, it releases like the smokiness into the water. So that's still cooking. Um, my nuts are now ready. Um, as you can see, the, the, some of the pumpkin seeds have popped and the almonds are nice and dark because that's how we want them to be. I, I mean, if you're going to roast nuts, like I think you should really go for it because like roasting brings out so much flavor and what you're doing is coaxing the natural oils in any nut out and the oils are the carrier for the flavor in the nuts themselves. So now let's also just have a quick look at our, our um, grapes are still, they need some time. They're starting to sizzle. As you can see, some of them are releasing some juice. They look gorgeous. They actually brighten in color as they roast. Um, but I'm going to start, and by the way, the recipe called for walnuts. I didn't have any walnuts in the house, so I decided to use almonds. And that's just kind of the Sussman way, like whatever we have around is what we use. So I'm just prepped, I prepped a little bit in advance. I cut four cups each of um, purple and white cabbage. Sharon, I wanted to ask you also in relation to onions, like, is mm -hmm. there a difference in nutritional value between uh, purple cabbage and white cabbage and also between red onions and white onions or are they like exactly the same? So they, they have some different, the, the colors actually, just like in peppers sort of, there are yeah. different nutritional, yes. So Again, we talk about eating the rainbow, about, you know, uh -huh. bringing in the different colors. So, yes, you're gaining. It doesn't mean that white cabbage, you know, it, it should not, okay. you know, you shouldn't eat it. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The more colors okay. that you bring in, the more types, for sure. All right. Along, that, guys... along those, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry interject. Uh, along those lines, somebody had asked if brown rice is a better substitute than quinoa for the frica for gluten-free individuals. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Sharon, me, or from a nutritional point of view or from a culinary point of view? <laughs> oh, so from a nutritional perspective. Oh, yeah, Go ahead, you're Sharon. there. Okay, I'm sorry, can you hear me? From a nutritional yes. perspective, quinoa is actually one of the, I think the only grain that's a complete protein. Um, there are amino acids, I think 13 amino acids that combine to make a complete protein. So animal protein is complete. But usually like when we talk about rice and beans, um, combining them, that is that was so that we could get a complete protein for somebody who isn't eating an animal, you know, an animal protein. So quinoa actually happens to be a complete protein. So as far as nutritionally goes, and it has more protein, more fiber than brown rice. I've actually, I, you know, looked at, I read labels all the time when I'm shopping, food labels. And surprisingly, brown rice very often is like two grams of fiber. We think it's going to be very high in fiber, but it's actually, it, it's better don't they rice, sometimes but... don't they sometimes polish the rice and take off yes. some of the fiber? Like that's yes. the issue with the rice. Yes. Right? So not all brown rices are equal, but I think nutritionally, if you can, and you, not everybody loves quinoa, um, but if you, I think quinoa would be a a, a, a more nutritious, um, you know, choice. Not to say you yeah. can't use brown rice, but if they're asking. All right, you guys, I'm slicing some radishes. And what I did was, if you can see, I cut the radishes into sort of like thin, uh, just sort of thin rounds. And then I go across with a knife and I make like really simple julienne, kind of the same technique that you would do with um, with ginger. That's the way I like to I peel the ginger. And then I cut it into like nice kind of planks as they're called, as they taught us in culinary school. Very, very fancy. Um, but for something like a carrot, I, I have my julienne peeler, which is one of my favorite kitchen tools. And I'm just going to take that and cut beautiful strips. I really like hand cutting things for this salad just because I like a variety of lengths and thicknesses and textures for the vegetables. So like the cabbage I chop by hand, of course you can do everything in the food processor. Please don't, I'm not, ju no judgment here, but if this is just one carrot and I really like the, the result, I'm just peeling here and once you once you peel a little bit on one side you get a flat surface going and you can just kind of keep um keep going here until you have like some really nice carrot shreds um this is also great if you're doing zoodles you can also cut down on 
um, pasta by adding some carrots and cutting down on like rice noodles. It works really well with actually, if you're doing like an Asian dish. Um, and I do this sometimes with different vegetables. So these things and all of my cabbage and everything are gonna go into um, a bowl. And Sharon, you tell me when you're ready for the next step or I can just keep going. But if you have something to do, feel free to, yeah, to, to contribute. Absolutely. So perfect timing because the mushrooms have actually released a lot of water um, and it, they've actually shrunk a lot in size. It's, it's probably, they're probably about half, this mixture is about half of what it was when I added the fresh mushrooms. So um, I'm going to tilt it. Hopefully you can see how they've shrunk and, and down. But what I'm going to do is um, I am going to, the other thing we're going to rehydrate is actually our raisins. Um, and the great thing about this is, you know, at the bottom of your raisin, you know, container, you've got these old dried out, like sort of shriveled, really, really shriveled raisins and they're not always so appetizing to eat. But in this recipe, you just can add them and they will um, plump up and rehydrate. So it takes some of that uh, moisture from um, the mushrooms. The other thing is I'm going to be back here. I hope you have a little bit of um, a, a sight line for what I'm doing. I'm going to just cut up a whole green apple. And I'm going to make it into um, sort of smallish bite-sized pieces. I'll show you. With the skin on, right? I kept the skin on because I wanted to get, to sort of bump up that the the fiber a little bit more. So yeah. yeah. And also the yeah. and also the color, the green color, along with the celery in this, really um, just it, it really adds something to it as well. So. We're gonna, I'm gonna cut up this, um, this green apple into the, like I said, the small bite sized pieces. I'm gonna add it in and then also continue cooking the mixture so that the apple becomes soft. We don't want the apple to become mushy. We do want it to be defined, but um, we do want it to soften so that it's not like a crispy. And that will also happen when, when it goes into the oven and cooks. So we wanna get it started. So I just mixed, um, so now you could uh, slice like apples head. or you could yes, use dried apples, you could use red apples. And, and by the way, yeah, I was just going to say, if you don't have a granny Smith or a green apple, you can use a red apple, which would also probably add some very pretty, pretty color as well. Um, I like the, the, the granny Smith because it adds a little bit of tartness. It's not a super sweet, um, apple. So it plays off of the raisins and we're going to add a, just a, a drop of honey. So. Um, I, I happen to like that for, for those reasons as well. Um, and it does maintain it, its, um, you know, its shape a little bit better than some of the other apples. So I'm going to raise oh. my heat a little and continue. Yeah. And then watch, you know, the raisins are plumping and the apple is starting to soften. So great. That's the, that's the next step in this recipe. There were okay, a couple so, questions. Oh, sure. sorry, Adina. There Go were ahead. a couple of questions that came in. Um, what do you think about gluten free? oat matzah a substitute you had talked about uh sharon i think that one's for yeah. you yeah yeah so again I, I have to make a disclaimer i haven't tested this them all in this recipe so what um i i think that any anything you can try anything and see if it works i don't know about the texture or how if it holds its shape um when it's you know when you uh, add i totally uh, think it will work i think any yeah. matzah will work. I think whole wheat matzo will work. I think uh, egg, we're egg using matzo. whole wheat matzo today. <laughs> I think, you know, I think honestly, you can't go wrong. Like the matzo doesn't really maintain its super integrity anyway. It does get really soft. And so maybe it'll be a little softer or a little more al dente, depending on what kind you use. But I, I personally think you could use any kind you want, which is what our mother would do based on what she had in the house. <laughs> Absolutely, exactly. And whatever, you know, whatever we're seeing, like it, it does, you know, you do, you'll see at the end, there are, you can see pieces of matzo, but it's, it's not, if, if it falls apart a little bit more, it's absolutely fine. I would say try okay. it. Okay, I'm happens. just going to advance along my uh, quinoa, my quinoa. So as you can see here, uh, my uh, frika is done. You guys, all the water has evaporated from it. And what I do is I don't want, I want to serve this room temperature. So a, a nice thing that I do is I, I sometimes decant my grains onto a sheet pan and spread it out. And that way it just really cuts down on the cooling time. So like, this is just, you know, 
uh, it just anything that's piled up is going to take longer to um, to cool. So I'm just taking all my quinoa. My I keep calling it quinoa because it's almost ten o'clock, but it is frica after all. And then I'm, I think that my grapes are ready to come out or are close to it. So I want to show you. They look great. They're they're wilted, as you can see. What I like to do is I like to sort of tilt it, and if I see that a lot of juice is coming out then I know that the grapes are almost ready. Um, and this, I'm gonna put them back in for another couple of seconds. Um, but those are the basic ingredients for a vat salad. I have my roasted nuts, I have my frica ready, I have my grapes uh, roasted, and then, you know, it just has a bunch of herbs and are super, super simple dressing. But one thing I'm gonna do for my um, slaw, is I'm gonna take, also Sharon, I'm using a green apple. So I guess we're apple tones today. Um, and since the dressing has vinegar in it already, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take my apple and just really thinly slice it into wedges. Like I'm not gonna do anything fancy here. And then because the apple might sit in the salad for a little while before um, I actually complete the dressing, I'm just going to toss it in like a tiny bit of the vinegar that's in the dressing. So that way it'll prevent the apple from browning. Um, I just, as you can see, there's like nothing special about the way I'm cutting this apple. And you could do kind of whatever you want. You could use red, you could use green, you could even use a pear, which I think would also be super delicious, especially this time of year. Um, and I'm going to just take a little bit of cider vinegar. Um, I'm not measuring, just, I'm just doing just enough to prevent it from browning. And I'm going to add that as well to my slaw here, which is developing nicely. So you see, I've got orange, I've got um, apple green, I've got the pale white of white cabbage, I've got red cabbage, I've got, um, I'm gonna add pomegranate seeds and herbs and it's gonna be this, our mother always said you should have at least three colors on the plate. <laughs> And I think that this dish passes the test. Um, Sharon, are you ready to carry on with another step or do you uh, need a little um, more time? No, absolutely. There are a couple of questions that came in if I could just interject. Sure. Um, one was when you are roasting uh, the nuts or um, the grapes huh? on um, a cooking sheet, do you, uh, it looked like you did not use parchment paper, but somebody was asking, um, um. I definitely wouldn't use parchment paper with the nuts because there's no oil, there's nothing sticky that's going to impact the sheet itself. I am a big fan. I, I use all of my sheet pans for food styling and I like them to look messy and used and cruddy and old. So I like kind of when stuff accumulates on my pans, I don't need them to look perfect. If you want your sheet pans to look spotless and to have them be really easy to clean, absolutely use um, parchment paper or foil. I think parchment paper is more environmentally friendly these days. Um, so it depends on what I'm doing. Like if I want something to get really brown and crisp and dark or really caramelized, I tend not to use parchment paper, but if I'm looking for a more gentle, mellow roasting or something that's really, really sticky, then yes, I will um, use. Um, all right, these are done. I'm taking these out. They're gorgeous. Um, yeah. And those are going to go in our Frica once everything is cool. Perfect. And then uh, somebody was asking uh, if there's a substitute for the vinegar and mustard um, and whether Absolutely. or not. Absolutely. You can use lemon juice instead of vinegar. Um, the truth is my husband doesn't like vinegar that much, but I felt like every single recipe in Sababa had a lemon juice dressing. So I decided to kind of mix it up a little bit, but you could use lemon juice. And then for the mustard, um, maybe um, a little term powdered turmeric because a lot of what gives mustard its color is turmeric and maybe a little bit of horseradish or something spicy because um, mustard has spice in it and also a drop of white wine and also like I kind of think if you happen to have roasted garlic cloves around you could like mash them up and it would have some of that like nice savory maybe like mash up some lemon juice, garlic cloves, turmeric, and a little bit of spice of some sort. I think that could be like a kind of a fun mustard. What do you think, Sharon? <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, I like both. I love uh, citrus. And okay. I don't mind vinegar, but I know there are a, a lot of people who, um, who don't appreciate vinegar and don't like it. So yes, 
experiment, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. Right, so we've got about 15 minutes left. So Sharon, you want to, are you moving your dish forward or? I, I, yeah. Um, Jessica, is that okay? Do you have yeah, any more questions? It. Go for it. Okay. Okay. So Adina actually brought up, she, she brought up, um, I decided that I wanted to um, bump up the fiber a bit in this dish. So I bought, um, I tried, um, and it's become over the last few years with Passover to have like um, holy um, light matzahs in the house. And the fiber content on this is, this is almost six grams of fiber. And in a sheet of regular matzo, it's about one. So we're really amping up the fiber, which is great. Um, and it works the same way. And I, um, I demoed it and it was delicious. So all I'm doing is taking two, two boards of matzo and I'm going to um, literally just crunch them up in my hands. And like I was talking about before, the mushrooms actually release quite a bit of liquid. So I'm gonna see if I need to add any, and what I'm gonna do, sorry to interrupt myself, but um, if for some reason the pieces that fall in are too big, just take your spoon or whatever you're mixing with and just, um, you know, just kind of crunch them up within the bowl. There's no perfect science. Uh, they can be different sizes, et cetera. You just want to, make sure that they're sort of bite size, um, although they will soften a lot. And I'm mixing now and I see that a lot of the mushroom juices and all the juices that have come out of the other vegetables and even from the apple, um, the, the matzo is absorbing. So it's getting softer. I may need to add a little bit, um, but I'm, I don't think a lot at all. And this is the same time where I'm going to, this is my cinnamon. And I'm gonna just sprinkle it's a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Again, you can actually uh, play around with um, the spices if you want. I mean, you could put in um, cloves if you want. You know, a little bit of allspice. It's really, it just gives it more depth of flavor. Um, in my family, some people don't like those other spices, so I stick to the cinnamon um, in this dish. And then I'm just gonna drizzle a, a, dr a really not even a teaspoon of honey, just to give it a little bit of flavor. Um, and then a, a question yeah. in about the mushrooms. If somebody's allergic to mushrooms, would you uh, yes. think about substituting maybe eggplant or zucchini or what would you recommend? It's a great question and I, I was thinking about it in preparing for this. So again, I think that eggplant would be okay. It's just eggplant tends to get soft. I mean, Adina, you, from a culinary perspective, you can also, obviously, I love your input. So it probably would be a little bit of a different sort of um, texture and maybe a little bit of a softer um, stuffing. Um, I think zucchini might work actually pretty well. Um, and you might want to... Yeah, spend, maybe you would yeah. want to like pre-sear sear the vegetables a little more. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say, to get those vegetables, I might want to either maybe roast them or maybe get them brown on the outside so they re retain their shape a little bit more. Um, and then I think you can, yeah, you can have fun and see the flavor profile that you like, what goes with what. Um, and yeah, an experiment. I think it's a great idea. Great. And how much cinnamon did you throw in there? I did a half a teaspoon. Um, and it's just, it's just enough where it smells delicious. I wish you could all smell it. Aroma vision or <laughs> aroma zoom. Smell a vision. Um, <laughs> yeah, exact smell of vision, exactly. Um, so, you know, I don't think it should overpower the dish because you want the other flavors from the, you know, the apple and the raisin and everything, but it just complements it, I think. Obviously, if you love cinnamon or you don't like it, yeah, you, can, you can really. Um, I, I just want to highly promote this matzo stuffing, you guys. It's so good. Like, I, you know, I can't wait for you to see the finished product. Yeah. <laughs> if you under hot, you'll, uh, we'll talk about it more, but it's truly addicting. It's so good. It's savory. It's sweet. It's kind of meaty because of the mushrooms. It's got, it's, it's so good. And the, for the warm spices and the raisins, it's just a winner. And like, it's, it's so good. <laughs> I have I to say it. that I actually asked Adina if she thought it would be good to freeze and then defrost because I thought for people who want to prepare it in advance and put it in the freezer because there's never any leftovers in my house. It's, it's, it's always eaten. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. But, it, sure. but yes, it, it will freeze well. And I actually have one in the freezer that I demoed a couple weeks ago, just um, getting yeah. ready for today. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm basically done. Um, I'll let you, okay. you know, go and then I'm sure. going to put it in a pan and show you the finished product. 
Amazing. That's All right, you guys, I'm going to make two dressings now. I actually pre-made a little bit. So I don't know about you, but like if I have like the scrapings of a tablespoon of mustard in a jar, I'm going to make the dressing in that jar and assume it's the amount that I need. So I'm not wasting anything. So this has, a t I, it called for two tablespoons of grainy mustard, but I took a tablespoon of Dijon that I thought was on the sides of this. I added about a half a cup of the vinegar. I added a half a cup of olive oil. I added a tablespoon and a half of honey. And what really makes this dressing special is cumin. It's really a surprise and people really seem to enjoy like that warm earthy spice in this dressing. And I make almost all of my dressings in jars. Like I just feel why mess up another bowl and whisk another, you know, use another whisk. I just shake everything until it's incorporated. Um, that's one dressing that's ready. Um, I thought I would just show you a little bit about how I chop herbs. I, I pre-chopped here some um, scallions and some cilantro, you know, uh, I'm Adina, not more precious. Yes. Um, there was a question that came in about replacing the cumin and the cilantro with other spices. Is there anything that you might sure. recommend? Cilantro, obviously a lightning rod, a divisive, controversial herb. Um, parsley, scallions, mint, basil, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, one of the things that's a real joy about living in Israel is that like a bunch of parsley like this costs about 50 cents in the shook where I live. And I don't, I don't peel the leaves off. I just take the whole head of parsley and I kind of like tighten the top and I just chop and you know, the, 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 the stems towards the top are quite tender. So I've now created kind of like a, an herb table here. I have like chopped parsley, chopped cilantro, chopped scallions, and I'm going to use them to garnish and, and, and season all of my salads. And I just like to do, kind of do all those at once. And this salad also calls for a little bit of mint. So um, this is actually spearmint. Um, in the shook, you can usually find both spearmint and peppermint. Um, I find peppermint to be a little bit spicier. In this case, I am going to take it off of the um, off of the stems because the stems are really woody and tough and, and you don't need a lot of mint, but I'm There's, just going to chop a little bit. A lot of questions just came in about the spices. Uh, do you wash sure. before chopping? The and Yes. Yes. So I pre-washed my herbs um, and I usually put them in a big bowl of cold ice water. Um, and then I put the whole bunch in the salad spinner and then I make sure it's really dried really well. And I store my herbs in little glasses with water, just like either on the counter or in the fridge, actually, depending on how hot it is outside. So um, I definitely wash my herbs. Yes. And um, how, long do store, how, how long do store-bought spices last? Store-bought herbs, you know, you wanna look for things that don't look dead when you buy them. <laughs> um, so, you know, you can get really good herbs in the States everywhere, you know, um, I would just, you know, if, if the recipe calls for cilantro and the cilantro looks a little sad, I would get parsley instead. I would just use your better judgment and get the best product possible and not feel too married to the instructions in the recipe. I always like to say that recipes are kind of more like suggestions than hard and fast rules. And I think that any good recipe, um, it makes itself open to interpretation. So in this case, for instance, we're gonna be using um, I'm putting scallions in here, but maybe I'll throw in a little cilantro because I like it. Now look how beautiful these colors are here. Um, okay. And all that I have, so pretty. And then all I have left to do is put in some pomegranate seeds and dress this one. So I'm going to do that and just show you, um, you know, beautiful pomegranate seeds in here, you guys. I mean, check that out. Like wow. they're so red and so beautiful. Um, you know, everyone has their methods for seeding pomegranates. Sometimes I just do it like this. I'm kind of lazy. I'll just, you know, do them, like take some seeds and just straight out of the pomegranate and into the salad. Um, you don't need a lot. They're so bursting with flavor and so beautiful. So I'm going to just hold that up there so you can see how gorgeous that looks. Um, and then I'm going to dress it and I'm going to, this, this is a salad where, where that can withstand the dressing like for a while, cause it's cabbage and all kinds of tough stuff. So I'm going to pour about half the dressing on the salad, toss it, add my pumpkin seeds. And this salad is basically ready for consumption. Um, it gets better as it sits around for a while. Um, you've got tart apples, you've got, um, 
you know, tart pomegranate seeds, you've got earthy carrots, you've got crunchy cabbage, you've got scallions, you could definitely add some jalapenos or chilies if you're into that sort of thing, which we always are around here. Um, but here, I, this salad is ready to go. And I'm going to just, when Sharon and I sort of present our dishes at the end, I'm going to put the nuts on top and I'm going to hand it back over to Sharon to finish her dish and then I'll finish my second dish. There were two questions that came in. I just wanted to ask one to Adina and then the other one is for Sharon. Uh, of course. And uh, Does par, or maybe they may both be for Sharon, does parboiled rice change the nutritional value? I don't believe it does. Um, I, I would be happy to look into that, but I, am, I have not heard that I, and I don't believe it does. And the other question is, do you find that red onion loses the color and taste in the final product? And what is the function of the red onion versus the white onion? Right, so like we talked about in the beginning of the, of, of the you know, of today, um, for number one, the color, um, it just adds a very pretty color. And I'll show you in the final one, I'm hoping you can see it with the lighting in my kitchen, that yes, you do, you are able to see it. It dulls a little bit, um, but it also adds a certain sweetness to the dish. The, the yeah, the, isn't it a little more onion, mild? A little more it's mild. a little milder and a little sweeter. So there's like a balance there between the two of them as well. And like Adina said, um, you know, so we may only have purple onion and, you know, in the kitchen, in your kitchen. And, the, you know, that's fine. It's absolutely fine to use. I also just wanted to say something about someone had asked about adding less salt. Anytime you, you want to bump up your flavor, fresh herbs and spices can really add to a dish. And, and then you can decrease uh, the salt that, you, you know, add to the dish. So that's a way By to the way, did up. anyone else like us grow up calling it purple onion and purple cabbage, even though they're red onion and red cabbage? Because Sharon and I just call them purple. And I had to, my editors of all my cookbooks are always correcting me because I'm always referring to everything as purple onion. I know that's not a thing, but that's what that's what we call it in our house. That's funny. I didn't even like you that. have some people yeah. agreeing in the chat. Still yeah. think of it that way. Maybe we need to start a movement to change it to yeah. purple onion in all the cookbooks. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. It will be pretty nice okay. for the rainbow for sure. So yeah, I mean, there's a quickly, way. Um, yeah, yeah. In um, ahead, in uh, in the recipe, it called for a, an egg, and I, I wrote that if you don't want to add the egg, if you want to make it vegan or don't, if someone's allergic to eggs, you can leave it out. In this recipe, I actually left out the egg because this matzah doesn't have eggs, so this is actually um, a totally vegan. And if you can see, um, you have I just I sprayed this um. Uh, baking dish and um, you can still see very well defined the mushrooms and the the um, the matzo and the um, the you know the onions and the raisins and all so it, it is true I do see the, the purple onions I mean it also depends on how dark you know the outer part of the red purple onion is darker so if you use that that will maintain the color a little bit more but when you bake it also it you know it gets a nice brown brown flavor as well so then I will, will have preheated my oven. Um, to 350 and this will go into the oven at 350 probably for about 40 45 minutes I would check it you want to make sure it doesn't get too brown or too dry um, it should be a little bit moist and with this stuffing sometimes it's looser and you know and when you you know you can cut it, it it might come out as pieces and sometimes you just scoop it up and and it's not you know perfectly defined which is amazing either way it tastes delicious um and it's, and it's great. So I'm going to put this in the oven and pull out the one that I have already prepared. Mm. Cool. All right. So you guys, I'm just going to finish off this Frika salad. I'm zesting using my microplane, which when I get asked in articles and stuff, what's your favorite kitchen implement? I always say this. It's just so useful. And like, if you should never juice a lemon without zesting it, in my opinion, it just always adds freshness and zestiness and that you know, a lot of the flavor of a lemon is carried in the oil and the rinds. And, you know, um, if you ever buy lemon extract, it's made from the oils and um, oranges also have that incredible oil. You know how if you crack a lemon rind and light and an orange rind and light a match, it'll crackle. That's because there's a lot of oil in the skin. So I've now zested that. And I thought I would show you guys for fun my incredible Israeli juicer. This is my Zaxenberg. It's the same one that you see in all of the Juice shops in Tel Aviv. Um, I've put a little, um, a little call, uh, sieve on top of my jar to um, catch the pulp, and then I just 
pump right into there. Now, this is an expensive machine if you're ordering it to America. It's not cheap here either, but the next time you're in Israel, leave room in your suitcase. And we're hoping to see you all in Israel very soon, I might add, because we are eagerly awaiting the return of tourists. And I'm sure that many of you are looking forward to seeing your friends and family here. So I'm gonna put in about a third of a cup of lemon juice, and then I'm gonna do, um, and as you can see now, the pulp is in here. I'm gonna add an equal amount of olive oil. I'm gonna eyeball this just because, um, you know, you don't have to be really precise. And since it's the exact same amount, that's okay. I'm gonna put in some chili flakes, which are gonna give it some really, really good flavor. Um, a little bit of salt and pepper. Um, and then this dressing is basically good to go. I'm gonna toss in the grapes into my salad before I toss in the dressing. But again, I'm just using a jar. As you can see, if you leave a lot of headroom in the jar, it's really gonna emulsify and get just as creamy as if you blended it or something like that. And look at these grapes have cooled. They're ready to go right into the salad. They're stunning color. Um, they taste amazing. I usually save a few to snack on. So I'm gonna keep these little Car super burnt caramelized ones here for my own private stash. Um, we've got our roast roasted almonds here um, instead of walnuts. Um, I'm gonna add the dressing and I'm gonna throw in a bunch of herbs, like whatever I have around. And now I'm just gonna toss this baby up and you're gonna see how luscious and beautiful it is with the grapes and the herbs and the nuts and the lemon zest. Um, and um, this amazing smoky frika. So again, it's like a flavor contrast of smoky and sweet. And then you've got crunch, which we like really a lot in our house. And there you have your frika and grape salad. Amazing. We, there were um, a that came in. I just want to um, let everybody know that we've been taking notes on, on Edina and she's presentation. And so we will be sending that we will definitely cover the name of the juicer and um, and where it's yes. available so that you can yes. find that out later. Um, Adina, a question had come out about whether or not, um, which is more spicy, peppermint or spearmint? Um, uh, peppermint. I think um, the name pepper is the, is the, uh, the way to remember since if you're anything like me, my memory is completely shot. So if I think pepper, I think it's a little bit spicy. Um, peppermint is a little bit hotter than spearmint. Great. And I think there was one other question that had come in that I missed. Oh, uh, substitutions for pomegranate seeds. Oh, um, great question. Um, you can use craisins um, instead of pomegranate seeds. You can use, um, I actually recommend tiny chopped green apple because it sort of approximates the tartness of the pomegranate seeds. So you could do that. You could do dried currants, just anything that has a little bit of tartness, you know, because what you're looking for is that burst of tartness um, to contrast with everything else. So those are some good substitutes. Green apple is my favorite actually, and it's obviously the most available and the least expensive. So it's always a good option. A couple of people are, are throwing in uh, ideas like barberries and dried barberries. Sour yeah, oh my gosh, those are great suggestions. Barberries can be hard to find. Um, you can usually find them again, in Persian markets, because um, there are Persian, Zeresh, you know, Persians are known for their incredible rices and stews and those barberries um, go in all those stews. So they're tiny little, very tart, beautiful dried uh, berries. Sharon, you wanna show everyone your stuffing? Yes, so this here is the stuffing. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna bring it there. It looks so wow. good. It looks amazing. Uh, it, it, it smells delicious too. You can see it's uh, browned a little bit on the top. Everything is nice and plump. Um, and it's just uh, it's just a real nice hearty side dish. It can be served anytime. And like we talked about, you can, you can use bread, you can use other, anything else. I mean, you could also leave out the matzah, et cetera, or substitute, but it's really, um, it's sort of a go-to and it's also special. I don't make it all the time, but when, right. when I do everybody, everybody knows and they can smell it and they're very excited. <laughs> so that's, that's um, Does anyone have any questions about Shasharit or about anyone asking Sharon about her nutritional practice? Like, I mean, I would Sharon, I actually had a question that, you know, yeah. here we are talking yeah. in front of people, like <laughs> what's different about 
doing nutrition for kids and teenagers and for adults? Like what, what is the main difference? So, well, that's a very broad question, but kids are, <laughs> and they're not little adults. They are definitely, they have uh, different, um, they have different needs. Um, and also they're, you know, they're growing. So there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Once we've gotten into adulthood, there are, we, we have certain ways of thinking about things. I think sort of educating kids when they're younger um, is a way to sort of start to lead people on a, in a healthier lifestyle. Um, but yeah, yeah. They're, they're, kids are not, they're not, they're not many adults. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Cool. And it's not about weight loss necessarily. It could be a million, million things. No, my favorite quote is um, kids and really applies to kids of any age. Kids should eat a better diet, not be on a diet. And that's really oh, that's my cool. philosophy. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Adults too. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I said adults, uh, kids of all ages and all, you know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and you are available virtually. Somebody was I asking. I am. Ba basically, my practice is a Zoom practice at the moment with due to COVID, which I, I had previous b before COVID. So yes, absolutely. I, every, and everything is HIPAA compliant. And yeah, I'd love, I'd love to, for, to talk to people. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we will, I promise we will get the information on the, the juicer and get that out to everybody who's on this. Um, uh, okay, Adina, do you want to show your beautiful salads? Um, yeah, put them right here. You can, they're all, yeah. if you want to highlight this camera, yeah. um, there, here we have the Frika and grape salad. Um, and here we have the beautiful slaw. Um, you know, you guys can always add a little more or less dressing. You can add more, on, um, apple. I think I forgot to put red onion in the salad, by the way, but feel free. Um, always seasoning with salt and pepper. Salt is the most important seasoning for any uh, food. And if you're going light on salt, um, a little goes a long way. So, you know, um, and that's all from my end. I mean, it was so fun to be here and just to so talk fun. about the bake sale and to see my sister for an hour uh, cooking live. We'll be together in person baking for our show share at bake sale for the New Jerk Teaneck in Manhattan in a few weeks, which we do every year. And we uh, didn't do last year, so it will be really yeah. fun to be back together. It will yeah. be. Yeah. Well, we're so grateful for both of you for being here tonight, um, you know, or and this afternoon. <laughs> um, it, it's been amazing and watching you, um, you know, share, share, share it and share your recipes with us has been really just a, such a, a great program. Thank you. Uh, we recommend that you follow Adina on Instagram and you check out Sharon's website. Uh, and we want to thank Carly again for sharing her inspirational story with us today. Please take a moment to fill out a brief evaluation survey that's going to be linked in the chat now. As I mentioned, we're giving away three Sababa book, cookbooks and a one, one hour virtual nutrition coaching session with Sharon. So if you are interested, please completely fill out the evaluation to enter the giveaway. Evaluations really do inform our future programming. So thank you so much for taking a minute to fill it out. We'd love for you to stay connected with Char Share It via social media on Facebook or at Char Share It Official on Instagram, where we post about events like these, program updates, and fun ways to get involved. Please never forget that Char Share It is here for you and your loved ones during this time. Char Share It provides emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help navigate you through the cancer experience. All are free, completely private, one on one, and our number is 866. 4742774. You can also email us at clinicalstaff at sharsharet.org. Our social workers and genetic counselor are available to each of you. You are our priority. So please never hesitate to reach out. We're all going to get through this together. Finally, I want to let you know that we have several exciting webinars on a wide range of topics planned over the next few months. Our next Shar Share It in the Kitchen webinar is Monday, November 22nd with the kosher baker, Paula Scheuer. Paula will be demonstrating some lighter desserts for our holiday celebrations. And the link to register is in the chat. Please check out our website regularly to see what topics are coming up. The link is in the chat. And you can also access the recordings and transcripts of all of our past, past webinars on our website. From all of us at Char Share It, thank you so much for joining us today and throughout the summit. We hope you've enjoyed the informative programming throughout the last week. Thank you.
Thank nice. you guys Thank you. so much. It was, it was so wonderful. great to be here. Thank you. Such Thank an you. honor. Bye. Pleasure. Bye, Sharon. Love you. Bye, Love everyone. You. Thanks for following along and stay in touch. Yes. And we look forward to being in yeah. touch with all of you. Bye. Be, well. be healthy. Bye. 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 Taking off the suit.